Hello everybody, this is Mary Catherine. It's good to see you again. This past week I was out of town. I had to dash up to Virginia for some family things to do uh, for just a few days. And while I was there, I found the most lovely little yarn shop. I love these independent yarn shops and I like to try to support them as much as I can. Well, the first thing I asked was, um, I had, you know, two rooms full of yarn. I said, do you have any fiber or roving? And she said, yes, we do. So they, they didn't have a lot, but they did have some Malabrigo. Um, this is a beautiful, mostly navy. And this is just a beautiful autumn tones. I fell in love with both of them. Um, this is, I don't know, I don't know what all this stuff means. Mend, Mendragora. That's what that one says. And this one says 870. Candome. So if you're interested in either one of those, I can't wait to see how they spin up. That'll be fun. The other thing they had, I've only heard of this, but I've never bought any, was this uh, Eucalyn soap for washing fiber and, um, and washing yarn. Of course, they sell it for washing yarn, I guess, after you're done making your item, your sweater, your socks or whatever, you use that to wash it that first time, perhaps. Um, I've seen people on Facebook groups use that to wash their fiber, even their dirty fiber, I guess, when they're fixing it. Now, the other thing I told this lovely lady, she was an older lady, an amazing knitter, and she, and she teaches classes on knitting socks. So I told her I'd knitted two pair of socks, and they were both kind of failed attempts, didn't turn out very well. And um, But I did have sock yarn that I'd accumulated in my stash. Here's a bag of various and sundry sock yarns. They kind of look like sock yarns. They have that stripey look. And so she sold me a long cable. Oh dear, now what did she call? Mm. It's the kind of uh, knitting needles where you can remove the needles from the cable and you can mix and match your needle sizes to your cable lengths. It sounds like a great idea. Um, so I bought a pair of two inch, no, size two, size two, U.S. size two, um, little bamboo needles. I do love bamboo needles. So here's the bamboo needles. Aren't they pretty? Yeah. This is the, it's Spin is the name of the company that makes them. Now the cable that, that we ended up trying several cables. I wanted one that was very light and thin, very, very flexible. She felt it was very important to get a cable that did not twirl on its own. And so uh, the one that I liked actually did that. She said she would not recommend that. So she sold me a swivel cable, Chayagu Swiv 360. This is the cable. It stays on better. It says swivel action allows tips to rotate freely from the cable, which really does prevent it from, from twisting up. It's a, what did she say, a 37? No. Yes, this is a 37 inch, 93 centimeter uh, small cable. And so I have started a pair of socks with some yarn I've had for ages. It was thrift store yarn. It's a Lion brand. It's a superwash wool blend that's durable and soft. I didn't know it was wool, but it's superwash, so it won't shrink. It's called Magic Stripes. So that's what I'm using. And I, one thing I liked was that it was a brand new skein, and it says on the outside that it makes two socks. So I know I'm not going to start this pattern and run out. That always drives me crazy, although I do it to myself on a regular basis. So. Um, here's how it's working up with the stripes. It's really cute. I did put some um, some ribbing on the top. I kind of forgot to follow the pattern, um, the patterns on the back of the label. But uh, this lady at the yarn store convinced me um, not to use double pointed to make my socks, which that's what I had done before. And it is, I mean, I can do it. It's just a pain in the neck to constantly be switching needles. And she said, have you ever tried the magic loop method? And I said, no, I don't know what the magic loop method is. And um, so then she was describing it to me and I was like, wait, I did that. I did the magic loop method with my, um, 
circular needles when I was finishing off the toes of my slippers, but nobody taught me how to do it. I had to, through terrible trial and error, figure it out myself how to pull the cable through so that you could just keep on going. And that's how this works. So you don't have to change needles or anything and you just kind of pull the loop through. Um, there's all kinds of videos <clears throat> online about that. I'll try to link one if I, if I remember. Okay, so sock is coming along. I want this to be the year of, of quietly making socks in the background. I'm not going to do any videos about how to make a pair of socks because I'm clearly not very good at it. And there's a million videos out there already, so you can go look at them. So that was my fun yarn store visit. Yay! Like, I need more fiber. But, um, actually, I need to get rid of yarn stash more than I need to get rid of fiber stash. Okay. So the thing that's happening today is I'm going to, with great fear and trepidation, I'm going to warp up my loom from making this alpaca rug and um, we'll get a start on it and see how it looks. Maybe I'll get a feel for how far that fiber will go. I think I'm going to have to stop the weaving after a little bit and spin more, um, spin more of that wonderful thick alpaca. Okay, so let's see how this goes. This is how I put up my loom. I know it's crazy. I do apologize to the weavers out there. And this is going to be my warp. It's a nice sturdy cotton twine. I hope it works okay. And it's time to open up the loom box. Haven't done this in a while. So my pedal and my shuttles and my tensioning device down there. Let's go put it together. Now, if you're interested in this tensioning device that I'm going to put on, then um, I'm going to put a link here to uh, both a short video and a long video. Just look for them up there in the top um, that will show you how to use this tension device. I use it behind my heddle, and I have these side rails that it rests on. I have four dowels that I use for this purpose and um, you have to make everything snug and really latch it down but when you do that it gives you a beautifully even warp. I'm not sure how important that would be with this cotton but I'm just going to go ahead and do it because I'm in the habit of doing it. Okay. So I'll bring you back when I've got this all done. Okay so I've got my um, my cotton, I don't know if you call it twine, um, and I used all of that roll, so that's, that's as wide as my rug can be. Now, what I love about um, learning how to weave is that you learn things over time. One thing I learned was that I do not create tension on my warp strings at this stage. I don't need to pull them, and I don't need to make sure that the tension is even back here on my warping peg, which is kind of where you can't see it back here. I have it, um, let me see, I have my warp peg is just the knob of a chair and because the tension is going to be created when I put the tensioning device on and so I don't have to worry about the tension now so I'm going to um because all you do is pop it off there and you remove all the tension at the moment that you do that so um now I can get rid of my chair but I do need to keep track of where the halfway mark is on this this is almost like it rains on a horse and I'm gonna snip these and then we'll do our tensioning device. There we go. Okay. So I'm going to put um, my dowels on first. I'll bring you back when I get some of this done. Now I've straightened up my um, warp threads. And there's not too much straightening to be done because... Um, for this rug, I'm only using every other slot so the warp threads are not very close together. Um, so they're lying kind of limp and loose. Now I'm going to put my other two dowels on. I slipped these two underneath the loom and just raised them up underneath so as not to cause too much trouble. The smallest one I'm going to put here. And the next one I'm going to put here. Okay everything down and now I'll put on my zip ties and my rubber bands. 
it's useful to put your zip tie on the end of your tensioning rods while they're still kind of uh, not in a straight line, but you can bunch them up together. It's so much easier to get them on then. So I'll put them that way. Now I'll do my rubber bands. Oops, I didn't do that wrong. Okay. So I think I'm going to do rubber bands instead of ponytail holders because they lie flatter. Okay, now we're just going to slip these rubber bands underneath the side rail and hook them on the end of each. Like that. I've already done the other ones, so it's already pretty tight. And this may seem rather fiddly, and I would agree it is, but I... I'm so happy to have a really, oh God, I think not, there we go, a really, really consistent tension on my weaves um, where I don't have so much trouble later on with my weaves when I have terrible tension in the middle of making a shawl or a scarf or whatever it is I'm making. Okay, so there you go. Tensioning device is on. I also have um, some rubber bands here on the ends wrapped all the way around uh, the side rail of the loom and um, these yardsticks so that it doesn't come popping up. Okay, and now I think it is time to start working up. And I just, all I have to do is crank my gear around and just hold on to it here, but I really don't have to put any tension on it here because all the tension is being created in those beautifully straight, oh, there's one little kink, um, warp threads on those rollers. Hoping this rug is not too long because my thing is not really knowing how um, how long to, where to put that peg on the end, exactly. Okay. And that's just so easy, and not only is the warping up easy, but the tension is absolutely even and perfect. There's no loose warp threads up there that I have to worry about. It makes it so that your weaving is easier because your shuttle doesn't catch on a loop warp, a loose warp thread. Um, okay, I'm going to do that a little bit more. Okay. All right, now I'll take the tensioning device off. I'll slay through the eye um, slots and then I will be ready to start I'm getting my base here so I can start my rug. I've slayed my um, warp strings through the little eyes in between. I used, uh, I didn't use the slot, the eye for the slot that was vacant. I used the eye for the slot that was used since I was using every other slot. Anyway, and then um, I am tying this on the same way I do any other weave because I uh, Pocket House Studio doesn't have any actual like how-to videos for weaving. They just have a few random little short videos of them weaving and not really sure. And they have totally different looms than I do. So I, I don't even know if, if their method of lashing on or what, however they attach their, um, their warp if it would apply to my rigid head loom. So <clears throat> I'm just using, and this is the same cotton string, it's a thick string that I'm using for my warp. I've used this to lash on for years. Okay, so there's the last one. I was really careful with my knots here at the end of my warp, trying to get them real even because um, 
Uh, there's not any uh, throwaway yarn here at the bottom. As far as I can tell, they really, well, I know that at the bottom of the, of the rug, they have some, um, a few rows of weaving of this. Okay, let me get this nice and tight. I'll be glad to take this off of this dresser. It's nice to do it standing up, but that, it's a little weird. So. Okay. Okay, this, uh, this famous Chris I'm talking about. Oh, what is their name? Chris and Andrew Hamacott, something like that. They live on the Isle of Lewis in the Hebrides. Doesn't that sound exotic? I think it sounds cold. <laughs> All right, so when I asked her if I could weave an alpaca rug with my um, my loom and, and all that, my spinning wheel. She said yes, but here were some little caveats or instructions. First of all, the warp threads. I need to have four or five per inch. Now that's not what this is set up for. This is a seven and a half WPI. Uh, this is, so if I had done, used every single slot, I would have ended up with too many warp strings. And that's why I skipped um, a slot. She said the weft should be very, very thick, the alpaca. She told me not to ply the alpaca. It's just a single, but very thick. And then I'm gonna need something very strong to beat. And when you pull that heddle down and shove your, um, your weaving down, that's beating. I need something good and heavy to do that. I, I, I don't know why that's, the heddle is not strong enough, but she said I might need some kind of a comb or something like that, or a fork. Uh, maybe even the hackle, although it has kind of pointy ends. And the other thing she said was that I should spin the fleece and then wash it and then weave with it. So I've done, I've done all those instructions. So we'll see if this works. I'm going to give a little bit, a, a couple of rows, like I said, of, of the um, cotton, and then I'll launch into some of the dark alpaca first. Okay, this has been very pleasant. Feels good. I wish I had more um, fluffy stuff sticking up like Chris and Andrew do on theirs, but I can't make as thick of a yarn an alpaca single as they can, but um, my spinning wheel doesn't have that big of an orifice. So this is what I get, but this is fine. Um, let me see, how many inches have I done? Looks like I've done about five and a half inches. That's not too bad. Um, and the thing that I'm using to help me beat this with is this comb. It's very wide tooth and it doesn't have sharp points and so it's not gonna damage my warp cotton. And um, after I go across and back each time, I go back with this and I press it down firmly. And that I think is, is doing a really good job. And yeah, my, my heddle would not be able to do as good a job as that. All right. So far, so good. It feels very soft. That's lovely. Um, so this was basically one pretty full shuttle of a double strand over here. You see the tail end of this one and a little bit more of the second one. So uh, I imagine I'm going to have to spin some more. I think so. I've gotten a little further today. Now I had a little patch where I had um, a combination of the dark brown and the white on my shuttle one strand of each. This white has more little curlies that stick up and I really like that. I won't be trimming those off. Um, but I really, I even like that part. So now I'm moving on to some more dark. Um, and this is not going to be a huge rug. I've probably already got like what, 10 inches or so. Um,
to the end of the alpaca weaving and here at the at the very I guess you call this the top of the rug um, I'm putting three little rows more of this cotton twine before I do two half knots all the way across and then I do the final knot and I'm getting this instruction from Pocket House Studio um, because Chris has been weaving rugs forever and she does it professionally and has for years so I figure she knows what she's doing I want a nice secure edge because this apparently is the weak spot in a rug is along these two edges top and bottom so we're going to make it nice and secure and I thought I would just note down here on this end this is what um, the warp looks like after I've only beaten it with my rigid heddle but after I use that comb on it, it tightens down like this. And I've done that all the way along, so I really think that this is an important step, is to give it that extra hard beat. Now the first knot I'm tying, um, I've done a few of them here. And you take the last one that hasn't been knotted. I'm doing this with one hand while I hold the camera. And you make a little loop over the next string and just put it in there. Make a little loop and pull it tight this way. And so I'm pulling them all toward the rug. And then I'll snip this one and it'll become my next one that I loop. Okay, and I'm going to do that all the way across. Okay, so I've taken it all the way off of my loom. Again, this has just been finished with that one half knot so far. This is the top edge, but this is the bottom edge. And what I have to do here is I need to undo all these knots that I used to attach it to the loom and get just straight strings here so I can do the same thing, same finish I did here. Now you can see that some of these rows of cotton are real loose so when I get these undone I'm going to try to tighten those up a good bit um, before I do the series of knots that you finish off the edges of the rug with. Now I'm going to come back and do the second knot and I have all these strings lying up here where they were finished. And I'm taking the one on the end and you take the next one, you tuck it under Not it tight. This this goes a lot faster. Those first knots were not as hard as I like, but this is kind of the finishing of that first knot. And then after I go all the way across with this knot, I'm sorry about this is a little bunchy down here. That's because I'm a beginner. This was the end of my first left pass. I left it as a loop there. I'm not real sure why I did that. This I think will be a very secure edge. I'm not sure that my rows of cotton on this end are as beaten as tight up against the um, fiber warp, uh, fiber weft as the other end is, but it's the best I can do this first time. I did have uh, about a half a ball of alpaca, spun alpaca left, and of course I have some more alpaca that hasn't been spun yet, and I might have enough left for another small rug. This one end up, ended up quite long. It's almost like a little runner. Okay, enough of this. I'll bring you back when I've done the other end too. And we start doing the last knots. 
Now from watching, watching Chris do this last row of knots, what she does is she takes a bunch, I think she takes like five or six, I might do four, and she'll take the first four and then she skips one and takes the next one. Now these are all bunched up here, but then she knots it nice and tight. Boy, I can tell I'm not going to be good at this. And then she takes that one that she skipped and she adds it to the next four and then skips one. And this overlapping of these two means that you don't get a weak spot right there where your rug might um, come apart later on. One, two, three, four, and skip one. Okay. Great. So that's what the finished edge is going to look like. I'm going to need to tuck these in and tuck that in somehow. But that's what that finished edge is going to look like. Mm. And I'll snip these a lot shorter. Because I have the heater on in my studio, all the animals love to come in and hang out with me there. Leo. And there's Tricky. She's on the floor. Last of all is Bobo, who's actually underneath my desk. All right, it's done. There it is. Oh, wow. That's kind of fun. It's pretty long. I should, let me measure it. That's a good thing to do. Okay, so it is, um, about 15 and a half inches wide, not very wide. I think I would have liked it wider. And 36 inches long, a yard long. Wow, I am super pleased. I think I want to do another one of these. It's nice and stiff, but very soft and thick. Well, I'm, I'm really excited. Thanks for following along on this. And um, if you've got a spinning wheel, or if you don't, but you have some access to some uh, bulky, soft yarn, and if you have a loom, um, if you have a narrower loom than mine, it would work. Um, but rigid huddle looms can do a lot. You don't have to have a floor loom to make your rug. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye.